Previously in Hedge Knights, the trio departed the ruins replete with books, tomes, and looted food. They were eager to make haste back towards the Bison Castle before the foliage on the trees fell for winter, which would make it rather difficult to travel obscured from the visitors. A rather ill-equipped and misguided reigning party flooded through the main gates, only to be easily cut down by arrows. Judea worried that this was only the cannon fodder looking to probe defenses prior to a larger raid. The newly built main bison barn and pasture was ready for the herd. Freshly laid straw lined the barn, and the pasture offered plenty of room for their woolen friends to roam. The old barn was then converted into both a new space for recreation and expanding the prayer room. Episode 45 Dire Times Tangier surprisingly fell well enough to get back to masonry and construction. Her and Judea were just about finished renovating the new space for recreation, a room sorely needed so that the children could play away from the kitchen, forge, and alchemy equipment. Although they didn't yet have the toys or tables built for the space, even an empty room could be used for charcoal drawings or even as a classroom with the chalkboards and desks awkwardly placed by the western heart. The room still needed a bit of cleaning. Scattered around the floor were the remnants of the bison food troughs. Luckily, the pantry had plenty of space to store the overflow. The room was poorly lit, but the adlets had plenty of iron to fashion some sconces to brighten up the place. Lazarus and Sappo were happy that there was excess food in the pantry storage because that would mean less time spent harvesting fungal caps in the Nutrifungus farm, work that nobody enjoyed doing. The visitors were never known to sneak up to the castle to attack, but it was rather unusual for them to signal their attacks using war horns. The pit in Judea's stomach grew. She suspected the last raid party was just a ploy to probe for weakness, and with the castle undermanned, this follow-up attack surely arrived to exploit that weakness. Judea rallied the archers to the main gate to mount a defense. Enemies were spotted just north of the gate, having breached the northern walls. The visitors knew the castle's weak points. Judea's intuition was correct. The marshy soil around the north was too unstable to support stonework structures. The visitors took advantage and breached a weak wooden door, arriving at the main gate far sooner than usual. The first wave of attackers wore very little armor and attacked in the dead of night enshrouding them in darkness. They rushed towards Lazarus much faster than he had expected. He only barely managed to close the gate in time. These raiders were unusually clever, using tactics and strategies that the Adelites had never seen. Judea had a sinking feeling. It was raids such as this one that laid waste to Penacook, Penobscot, and Wenwanak, three well-established strongholds of Adelites which had all fallen to ruin in the past few years. As soon as the gate slammed shut, the first wave of raiders searched for breach points to break into the castle directly. One tried to smash apart an arrow slit, while another worked towards destroying a utility door just to the south. Lazarus stood his ground, deciding to take on the attackers one by one in the narrow entryway, but without the knowledge of how many more attackers were coming. The blitzing skirmisher wave of attackers had been defeated, but without any time to recover, a new group had arrived. While Lazarus had easily defeated the two lightly armed rushers trying to blitz into the castle, he had inadvertently filled the entryway with corpses, preventing the gate from shutting. He worked to get the gate clear, but couldn't close it in time, and before he knew it, he was being overrun. He called for help from the archers. He needed backup urgently. The first to rush the gate was lightly armored for speed, but he held the gate open for two much more heavily armored enemies. Lazarus, in all of his might and finely honed gear, was being worn down. He struggled to stay on his feet 
succumbing to his many wounds, he collapsed in the archway, having done his best to hold back the tide of terror. Judea yelled to the other archers on the north side of the entryway to lure the raiders away from the open door into the castle. She goaded the attackers to chase her, knowing her own bow skills far surpassed the others. She could probably take on a few of the visitors all on her own. Judea saw a raider attempting to abduct Lazarus and risked her own safety to fell the abductor. Klein wasn't fleet of foot and sacrificed himself to offer Tangier and Sapo space to kill the spearmen. Judea yelled to Tangier to rush the northern Merlin. She'd guard the entrance with Sapo. Judea hoped that Tangier would notice the plate-armored abductor carrying Lazarus off westward. Judea was full of bloodlust and rage. Each arrow she pulled back threatened to snap her bow in two, unleashing arrows with such draw strength that they punched through plate and chain alike. Tangier screamed when she saw Lazarus being carried off, but managed to compose herself enough not to rush out of the Merlin gates herself and instead unleash a volley of arrows as well as she could to kill the plated visitor without hitting her husband. Judea saw another carry Klein off as well. So as soon as she finished killing the Axemen, she sprinted to join Tangier in the gatehouse. Arrow after arrow, the trio cut the kidnappers to ribbons, with each shot carefully aimed enough to avoid Lazarus and Klein. Sapple told Tangier and Judea to cover him, and he rushed out of the gate as soon as it was safe enough to quickly triage his two friends. Sapo instructed Judea to tend to Klein's wounds as best as she could, unless Tangier needed backup. Tangier, still in a panic over Lazarus, fired haphazardly at one of the fleeing raiders who was breaching the western wall to escape. Judea and Sapo were able to stabilize Klein and Lazarus, but they would both require an immense amount of additional care to ensure a full recovery. The breacher had escaped, and Judea yelled at Tangier to snap out of it and check up on the children. Tangier stammered a minute while trying to ask about Lazarus, only for Sapo to interject to say he'd be fine and that she needed to check up on the kids. Bash had sheltered in the castle, hiding behind his school desk, hoping that the next person through the main gate was a friend or family and not a raider. Shellbell, on the other hand, was caught out in the open, far away from the castle. He was quite clever, however, and decided to hide in one of the limestone caves to the south, far away from the battle. When he heard the fighting had stopped, he quietly and stealthily dashed back to the castle, unsure if there were still enemies about. As soon as Klein and Lazarus were able to be moved, all five of them retreated back to the safety of the castle, while on careful lookout for additional enemies. One of the first things Bash saw peeking up from his hiding place was Klein and Lazarus, both unconscious, carried back in. Judea told young Bash that they were both very brave and should be okay with some rest. Then she asked where Shellbell was. Just as she asked, she heard the footsteps that only a lightweight adolescent adlet would make, not one of a raider, coming from the main gate. Tangier had gone in search of Shellbell, unaware that he had already returned. She was busy putting out fires to the east while also aghast at how many breach points the raiders had made. Tangier was unbelievably relieved when she saw Shellbell safe and sound. After embracing, she told him that Papa had been wounded, but he was okay and recovering, being looked after by Sapo. Shellbell went to visit his father and wait by the bedside, while Tangier told Judea that much of the eastern wall had been compromised as well. Judea told Tangier to rest and get her own wounds looked after, lest they fester. Judea collected herself from the frenetic bloodlusted panic and steeled herself to rebuild the walls as quickly as possible, fearing yet another follow-up raid. Judea worried that the coordinated assault on the castle was a result of Megahoof and the others getting captured and interrogated, as it seemed too much of a coincidence to her that the first truly coordinated assault happened when half of the archers were away from home. Her mind spun and spiraled to dark places, and without Megahoof around to anchor her, she stewed in her own dark thoughts. She had pent up rage that she drew upon while fighting the ruthless visitors 
that she sometimes found difficult to control. She did her best to quiet these feelings as she hauled the fetid corpses of her victims off to the crematorium to be burned in the ash. The two boys put themselves to work. They knew that Sappa would have his hands full managing the wounded and ill. Bash tended the bread oven and Shellbell was helping to clean up the splintered debris from the breaches. Sappo noticed Tangier was still bleeding and sternly instructed her to lay down and rest so he could properly tend to her. He had enough to manage already. There was no need for her to let her own condition deteriorate. The adventuring trio were trekking along as fast as they could. With the leaves falling off the trees already, Dave decided to follow along the coast of the bay back home as they'd be able to cover much of their trail using coastal tides. The three were worn and weary. Dave and Madsy were not too happy about having to lug such heavy books and couldn't imagine the effort would be worth it. Even their curiosity about the oddly sealed steel box was worn out and the added weight didn't seem worth the effort anymore. But Megahoof insisted that nothing of value be left behind, as it was all important knowledge that could be lost forever if they discarded anything. Klein rose to his feet in his own bed, covered in bandages and poultices. He staggered out towards the kitchen and was greeted by Tangier, who was surprised to see him up already. I guess we won, huh? He said, followed up by a, at what cost? Tangier said that poor Lazarus had taken quite a beating. Thankfully, his armor mitigated worse injuries, but he was still out cold and recovering. Tangier told him that he'd only been out about half a day or so. He nodded as he took a large swig of mead. The brisk winter breeze coming in from the open window in Lazarus's room had lowered his swelling and also chilled him enough to raise him to his feet. Tangier raced over to embrace him. Lazarus had the same stunt look that Klein did, followed up by relief that they had won. His first question was whether or not everyone else was okay. Tangier said that Klein got fairly injured as well, but everyone survived and the boys were entirely unscathed. Just as Klein did, Lazarus headed for the shelf of mead to dull the pain. As battered and shell-shocked as everyone was, there was no time for idleness. The walls were full of breached holes. Those who were still able-bodied raced to fetch timber and stone to effect repairs as quickly as possible. While nobody wanted to acknowledge the seemingly clever tactics the visitors had employed, they all worried another wave may be upon them soon. Judea had spent the day collecting bodies for cremation and inspecting the walls for damage. She and Tangier certainly had their work cut out for them. There were holes all along the perimeter that would need patching, and many doors and door frames had been destroyed as well. It was getting too dark to do proper inspections. Judea's nerves had soothed, and she was ready for a good rest so she could pick up the repairs in the morning. Upon returning to the keep, she was gladdened to hear that both Lazarus and Klein had awoken. She worried her hurried bandaging of Klein hadn't been sufficient. Having collapsed from exhaustion, from fending off invaders and tending the wounded for nearly a day and a half straight, Sappo finally felt rested, but in the middle of the night, and thought it best to stay up as night watch. The boys were up as well, unable to sleep and making themselves busy, tending to the bison who had been spooked by the clamor of combat. Judea pulled Sappo aside so she could talk to him privately. 
she first asked if he was rested enough, and then segued into her concern that they were running out of wood to make repairs and renovations, but didn't want to draw him away from taking care of Lazarus and Klein. Sappo said he had plenty of energy to manage some tree cutting. It was no issue at all. He had in fact patrolled the night before with nothing to do, and apologized that he hadn't noticed the dwindling timber supply. Judea scoffed and sarcastically replied, Yeah, Sappo, like you're totally not doing your fair share around here. Pick up the slack. Sappo sternly saluted her, turned about face, and then goofily goose-stepped out towards the bison glade to fell trees. Lazarus sat by the edge of his bed and lifted his visor to inspect the condition of his shield. Some damage could be repaired, but the dense cracks and dimpling in his shield was likely beyond repair. He limped over to the clothing storage to replace some of his tattered and torn undergarments. He'd need to make himself another shield. Hopefully the next one would last. With Zappo felling trees again, Judea and Tangier got to work inspecting and repairing the boundary wall. So many sections had been broken, splintered, crumbled, and breached. The party had crossed the major thoroughfare, hiding their tracks in a forest becoming more barren of foliage as best as they could do swiftly. The distant mountains were now familiar. The long journey home was coming to a close. Dave grabbed Madzi and Megahoof and pulled them behind large ripthorn bushes. Their crossing hadn't gone unnoticed. Visitors were notoriously heavy-footed, and he heard the breaking of twigs and whipping of branches from a long way off. He told Megahoof and Madzi there weren't too many, and they weren't heavily armored either. The trio readied themselves for a counter-ambush. The driving rain offered little advantage to their ambush. Megahoof pointed out the one in front and called for them to fire. While he himself had missed, both Dave and Madzi had landed sound blows. The three split up to be harder to chase. Mazzy feigned weakness, goading the enemies in pursuing her, leaving Dave and Megahoof room to fire. She jogged ahead of her pursuers and then would stop, pretending to catch her breath. Being underestimated was a powerful advantage, and Dave and Megahoof were not wasting the opportunity to riddle the marauders full of arrow-sized holes. She bent down once again, as if she tripped or stumbled, but in fact she was knocking an arrow into her bowstring. She spun around and released perfectly, mortally wounding the closest raider. The raiders were slowing down and bleeding out. Dave laughed at Madzi's tricks, something he would have done as an undisciplined scout in his youth. While the tactics might not have been by the book, they were surely effective. Megu found it difficult to think of Madzi as an adult and not as a young child refugee like years past but it was abundantly clear she could handle herself. As the fight wrapped up, Dave offered advice to Madzi. He said that even if the enemies were monstrous, it was important not to become monstrous yourself, and instead see them as pitiful creatures needing calling. Madzi nodded her head and apologized. Megoof told Madzi that while he agreed with Dave, she had done a fantastic job exploiting the enemy's weakness and gullibility. So although he wasn't thrilled about her putting herself at risk, her strategy certainly resolved the fight in a rather effortless way. With everyone in the castle working towards repairing the walls, the work was almost already completed. The boys hauled slate and wood out to the broken section while Tangier and Judea dismantled some of the compromised gates and lintels to be replaced. Judea was relieved that the last raid hadn't been quickly followed up by another, but her worry about Megahoof and the others getting captured still lingered. The last thing the Adlets needed was a flash storm setting fire to the timber bridges and walls, yet a flash storm raged in the little glade. Judea stayed up to repair the last of the walls and also to make sure 
that if anything caught fire, it was extinguished quickly before more damage was done. Almost all of the most urgent tasks around the castle had been addressed, making it a little easier for both Klein and Lazarus to rest and recover from the last raid. While Lazarus did need to tailor some additional clothing and forge a new heater shield, those things could likely wait until he was truly well again. The respite also offered Tangier some time to spend with her wounded husband and baby Averen. A single gate on the eastern wall was the final piece to be repaired, and in inspecting the eastern wall for damage, Judea noticed that the boundary salix trees had already fully absorbed all of the polluted topsoil that was hauled out and dumped to them, meaning the Adelites could realize their goal of purging the entire courtyard of the inner castle of pollution without the risk of taxing their precious trees. The traveling trio proceeded more cautiously towards the Katrara forest, taking the extra time to cover their tracks and backtrack to throw pursuers off their trail. While they were tantalizingly close to returning home, they were not close enough to outpace raiders in a foot race to the gates. With Judea repairing the final gate, Tangier carefully dismantled the old prayer room wall to expand it further into the void where the bison barn used to be. The prayer room was certainly underutilized, but Megahoof insisted it was necessary for the Adlets to have a place that was tranquil for group gatherings and private reflection, and nobody could argue against that. Tangier hoped the renovations would brighten up the room and maybe increase its use. After one final and thorough inspection, Judea signed off on the repairs of the boundary wall. While there wouldn't be much stopping a future raid from breaching into the wall in the same way, the wall at least offered some protection and could delay breachers from reaching the castle quickly, and that delay could save lives. There was one final remnant of the raid, the mess and blood splatter. Now that the walls had been repaired, it was time to tidy up and try to return to a more regular routine. The Adlets were hoping for some rainfall or snowfall to wash away the blood from the gatehouse and courtyard, but the only storms to roll through were dry thunder and lightning, and they were done waiting for rain. Lazarus, still a little haggard and weary, approached Judea as she sipped tea at the dining room table. He placed an armor-clad hand gently on her shoulder and asked if she was okay. She turned her head and raised an eyebrow. Certainly less hurt than you, I suspect, she replied. Lazarus shook his head. You know what I mean. We're well into winter and they haven't returned. Judea smiled. Sure, I'm worried, but it's Megahoof. Whatever stopped him before? Lazarus cocked his head back and thought, pondered a moment, and then nodded, smiled, and joined her for some tea. She didn't know it for certain, but she was right. Thank you for tuning in to episode 45 of Hedge Knights Dire Times. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below. If you would like to join my online gaming community on Discord, Rodamont.com has a link to it, as does the description of this video. I would like to thank my Patreon patrons and Twitch subscribers, and also viewers like you. Without your support, this series would not be possible. Hope to catch you next episode. Farewell, my fellow adlets. <laughs>